Welcome to FACT's webinar called Practical Tips for Multi-Species Grazing. Our presenter today is Lee Reinhardt with NCAT and ANTRA. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I'll be moderating today's session. So before we dive right into the presentation itself, I do have just a few quick introductions. Food Animal Concerns Trust are FACT. We are a national nonprofit organization that is headquartered in Illinois. We promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. I direct FACT's Humane Farming Program, which provides a number of opportunities for livestock and poultry farmers. And this webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. So please visit our website to learn all about um, more of our farmer services, including our upcoming webinars and our very popular Fund a Farmer grant program. So this time I'm very pleased to introduce our expert presenter, Lee Reinhardt. Lee is an agriculture program specialist with NCAT and ATRA, serving the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic regions. He's also the author of NCAT's 2018 publication called Multi-Species Grazing, A Primer on Diversity. We're very lucky to have him with us to share his experience and expertise on this topic today. So without further ado, I am going to turn the floor over to Lee so that he may begin his presentation. Lee, please take it away. You got it. Thank you, Larissa. And thanks for inviting me on board to um, to have this discussion. Um, and it's a little weird because it's uh, it's a webinar and there's going to be some chat back and forth and some questions. Um, we got a lot of questions beforehand when everybody registered. Uh, gosh, I think we got about 70 questions or something. There's no way I can get through all of these, but I'm going to do my very best to, um, to, to, to cover some ground here and make sure that everybody's satisfied and certainly um, answer some questions at the end of the, of, of the presentation and um, offer up uh, my phone number and email for follow-up if, if there's things that you'd like to go on a deeper dive. So we'll do that. Um, I'm going to assume that not everybody is familiar with NCAT, National Center for Appropriate Technology. We were launched, we launched ATRA, ATRA Sustainable Agriculture back in 1987, and it's funded through a cooperative agreement with the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service. So we're committed to providing high value information and technical assistance to you guys, to farmers and ranchers and educators all over the country. We've got a headquarter in uh, Butte, Montana, and we serve our clientele from regional offices in California, Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi, and uh, my regional office, New Hampshire. So that's a little bit about NCAT. Let's see if I can get this thing to move forward. There it goes. Okay, so ATRA provides technical assistance on a wide variety of agricultural topics, everything from livestock and pasture management to crop production. We talk about soils, pest management, organics, whatever. Farm business management and startup. Um, are some of our uh, competencies. Our specialists, most of which are farmers themselves, have developed numerous educational tools, including web-based tutorials and podcasts, publications, and webinars like these. And all of them can be accessed from our website at atra.ncat.org. So that's a little bit about ATRA. All right, so this is me. Um, a little bit about me. I'm an agriculture program specialist with ATRA, and I serve the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic regions. And I write publications, and I provide technical assistance on sustainable agriculture, particularly with pasture ecology and grazing management. I'm a graduate of Texas A&M, and I've worked as a ranch manager in Texas and an extension educator in Texas and Montana, and worked with, uh, with PCO in, uh, in Pennsylvania for a while. And right now I live in my home in Northeast Pennsylvania and I travel around to do workshops and such. And you can easily reach me at my email. It's not up there, but I'll make sure you have it. It's lee at ncat.org. And with that, the introductions are done and we can get into this, into the meat of what we're going to talk about today. So I like to kind of start this off with a quote uh, from John Walker. John Walker is a range ecologist. and He's got a long history of conducting research on rangeland and grazing management. Um, over two, dec two decades ago, he wrote 
about multi-species grazing, and I love this. He says, the presence of multiple species of large herbivores is the typical condition of grassland and savanna ecosystems. And I really think this accurately sets the stage for our webinar today, where we take a look, uh, a, a little deeper dive into some of the benefits and the concepts and some of the practical applications of grazing multiple species together. <laughs> You know, I was taught in college that you plant one or two species of pasture forages um, and then you graze them continuously with a single livestock species, usually with on a single species of forage. And if you drive around the countryside, this is what you generally still see. You, I mean, dr just drive around, you've all seen it, closely grazed pastures with leggy tufts of, mat of mature stalks and, you know, less palatable plants and livestock, livestock scattered over the area, selecting the newest growth and kind of bringing selection pressure to bear on these plants, causing the eventual demise of those best forages. But, you know, this is changing. This whole paradigm is changing. There's been an interest in, multi in grazing multiple species together, either sequentially or at the same time. And in my travels, I've seen more producing adding diversity to their farms, not only by adding diverse pasture mixes and cover crops, and there's an awful lot of buzz about that with soil health, but with using multiple species of livestock. There's some good reasons for doing this, and we're gonna discuss those during this, during this webinar. So we're gonna be covering a lot. Um, it's heavy on concepts and ends up with some practical things that you can do uh, to begin grazing multiple species on your farm. We'll be talking about the benefits, synergistic relationship between multiple species and the soil and the plants and the fencing, the predators, parasites, and even a little bit on how to stock pastures appropriately. So this uh, on your screen is a, is a picture of the publication that we have at ATRA. Um, the multi-species grazing primer on diversity publication. Much of, much of this talk comes right from that publication and from the research that I did whenever I wrote it. Um, and so we're going to make sure that you have a download uh, for that, and you can go ahead and access that. That'll be that'll be uh, some good follow-up reading for you with all the resources that it comes with. So let's get on to some more. So why multi-species grazing? I'd like to go um, into a little bit of detail on some of the most compelling attributes of multi-species grazing. Um, first of all, taking a big picture, it allows producers to achieve biological efficiency and biological efficiency of the grazing resources. Multi-species grazing takes full advantage of all the biodiversity that you have out there exploits the selective grazing habits of different species of livestock and uses all kinds of different forage species in the mix. In fact, a multitude of forage species in the pasture becomes even more stable under higher foraging pressure with two or more species of livestock. It becomes even more stable whenever you have multiple species grazing it. What this means is that up to a point, forage stability and resilience is increased when grazing pressure is increased with multiple species. Another thing um, that is good about grazing animals together like this is it increases the, increases the carrying capacity of your pastures. And this is probably one of the most biologically and e economically vi viable systems that is available to producers to do this. Re re research has shown that when you're grazing two species together, like for instance, cattle and sheep, <clears throat> there's a 20 to 25% greater productivity and carrying capacity over grazing cattle alone. And if you look at the sheep, there is an eight to 9% greater productivity and carrying capacity compared to only grazing sheep alone. And this is due in part to the differences in the gra grazing habits that the animals have and the amount of dietary overlap between the species, which is a pretty important concept uh, that we'll go into a little bit later. So another benefit is the ecological resiliency of the, and, uh, of the pasture and better pasture health. Um, Multi-species grazing fosters more uniform defoliation of the, pl of the pasture, pla uh, pasture plants. It enhances defecation patterns and, and, the, uh, and nutrient cycling and plant animal nutrition. And I've observed, and you've probably seen this too, that animals tend to avoid grazing around their own dung piles, right? But different species really don't mind grazing around the dung of other animals, of other species. And this tends to keep forage growth constant and make a more uniform uh, grazing of the resource. And it kind of helps to set the plants to the same stage of, re of growth and 
um, you know, basically do again to the grazing habits and the selection of various combination of forages by different species on the land. So you can alter the landscape to a uh, healthy, diverse, and quality pasture through through multi-species grazing. You know, when the pasture is grazed with appropriate livestock species, it reduces the ability of any one species to dominate the landscape. And bringing in multiple species can really be used for vegetation management. Uh, for instance, bringing sheep in with cattle to take care of forbs and things like that. So that's an important aspect that I think we should we should be concerned with, and it's certainly a, a good reason to graze uh, more than one species together. So good uh, grazers understand that the growth habits of the weeds and the in the desirable plants, and they. Um, they know what animals to graze on them. This, th in this way, they're kind of target grazing, right? You're target grazing uh, for vegetation management. All right, there's a lot of good aspects. And one of the other really important ones is parasite control. A lot of the questions that we got before the webinar as I was looking through them had to do with parasite control. Combined with an integrated parasite management plan, grazers can actually reduce parasite population through timing of grazing. And then when you mix the two, two or three different species together, you really get a synergistic effect. Parasites have specific lifestyle characteristics that can be manipulated to reduce infection. For instance, you know, sheep parasites, you know, just generally do not affect cattle and cattle grazing can be used to break the life cycle of sheep and, and goat parasites. And generally this can be done vice versa too. So we'll, we'll go into a little bit more depth on parasite control as, as we progress through the webinar. So um, next to parasite control, another reason people like to run livestock together is to protect them from predators. Um, Oh yeah, I think you're looking at uh, slides that aren't um, that aren't moving. We're still on the same slide, guys. So we're going to move along. So I think everybody's in good shape. Um, so predators are, is a very good reason to run animals together. Researchers have noted that when small ruminants are bonded to cattle to form one herd or one flock, they tend to remain together and provide safety from predators. And it also provides you with ease of checking the livestock since they're all together in one place. Cattle fencing can often work very well for sheep when the sheep are bonded to cattle. And a complementary, a complementary benefit from bonding animals together is that grazing distribution is enhanced because sheep and goats whenever um, they are bonded together tend to spread themselves over the landscape a little bit more uniformly and last of all there's diversity of income since the carrying capacity is increased animal production is increased as well so you can so you can pretty much exp expect higher productivity and increased cash flow by just adding extra enterprises so now that we've kind of looked a little bit at the um, at the biological efficiency of grazing multiple species, let's kind of um, you know look at how we can fit this together on the landscape landscape and get a good grasp of the fundamentals and um, of in, in the practical I guess aspects of grazing multiple species. Okay, ready, turn. There we go. I'm going to go back one. Okay, everybody there? Slide eight, grazing dynamics. All right. So um, competition has led animals on the same landscape to occupy different dietary niches, right? And they developed, they developed complementary forage preferences and grazing habits. Um, these dissimilar grazing habits that they have occur due to the physical limitations of the of their ability to select different forages um, or the advantages that they have to detoxify certain plants. But the cool thing is that you can exploit the selective grazing habits of the different species to shape the landscape. Um, so we're looking at like competition. Uh, we're looking at dissimilar grazing habits and this whole idea of dietary overlap that really kind of work together. These are the forces and properties um, which kind of, you know, you know, stimulate uh, the, the biological activity that is going on on the on the ground. Cattle diets generally consist of about 70% grass, 15% forbs, and 15% browse. And these animals 
as you know, wrap the grass around their tongue and they kind of use a upward motion of their heads to rip it off, making tall grasses generally the natural choice for cattle. Now, if you look in contrast, the sheep diet is composed of roughly 50% grass, 30% forbs, and about 20% browse. So sheep are considered to be low, no, low nibblers, and so their nimble little mouth parts allow them to select the highest quality leaves within the pasture. Somebody asked what forbs are. Very good question. Forbs are generally what we would call weeds or broad leaves. Um, anything that is not a grass and that is not a woody species like, like brush or, or, or trees. So um, plantain or dock or um, any of the other you know, broad leaf uh, plants that are out there are forbs. Good question. Thanks for asking for that clarification. So we all know that goats are browsers. And by browse, of course, I mean they like to eat woody material and, uh, and trees and shrubs. So they're high nibblers, and they can metabolize tannin-rich plants, and they can reach really high into the canopy and select the leaves and the small woody material. Their diet is roughly 30% grass, 10% forbs, and 60% browse. So there's some notable differences in the diet choices among the species, but there's also some overlap. This concept of overlap, which I've been kind of mentioning uh, before, is a very important consideration whenever we start thinking about stocking the pastures. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, you should um, select animal combinations on, on the pasture based upon the plant species that are present. So, for example, let's assume that you have a grassy pasture, like, you know, the graph here on the screen. Um, and this grassy pasture is comprised of about 65% grass, 20% forbs, and 20% browse. What livestock species would be best on this pasture? So you kind of look at the graph, and given that the cattle are predominantly grazers, grass eaters predominantly, and sheep are intermediate grazers, these two species are likely the best match for this pasture. Notice in the diagram how the diets of both cattle and sheep roughly overlap with the pasture resource. Okay, so now let's consider another scenario. Let's look at a pasture that is 30% grass and 20% forbs and half browse, okay? So this is a comparison between cattle and goat diets. In this scenario, the goat diet matches the pasture much better than the cattle. The cattle could uh, be grazed with the goats on this pasture and would put more pressure on the grass than the goats would, while the goats would munch on the browse. Um, but care should be taken in this type of situation to ensure that the cattle don't overgraze the grass. This highlights the necessity of a good grazing and monitoring plan to ensure that the pasture, of course, is like not overgrazed and, and you don't have any one species uh, decline. Competition, again, is the, um, for resources is the main engine that drives the dynamics of multiple grazing species. Cattle or sheep alone in a single herd, graze similar plants and can, if, if not managed properly, drive plant succession towards less undesirable forages. So because the competition for similar forages is greater among the same types of animals than it is among different types of animals, multi-species grazing reduces competition for specific forages and it distributes defoliation, grazing of the forage species more uniformly. And this, this basically, as we know, can result in a healthier and a much more diverse pasture. So some so Nat asked, can you explain the difference between forb and browse here? Yeah, uh, forbs, of course, are the are are, are the broadleaf weeds, and the browse those are the woody materials. Those are the brush, the shrubs, the trees, and the things that you might that you might see in your pasture. So now let's talk. As soon as my slide gets to the next one. Let's see if it'll get here, because we're going to talk about fencing next. So one of the first things that you might be considering whenever you're thinking about grazing multiple species together is how do I deal with fencing, right? 
this is probably one of the most critical and the challenging components of multi-species multi -species grazing from a practical standpoint. And a lot of you in your questions asked about fencing. So we'll try to cover some of that here and certainly we go into a lot more depth with it in the publication. <clears throat> so your fencing should serve multiple purposes just, just because you've got multiple species. Certainly, you're going to want to keep your animals off the highway. You're going to want to keep them out of the neighbor's garden. Uh, but you'll also be using your fencing as a tool to, co to control grazing in specific areas for specific animals. So your perimeter fencing should be strong. It should be permanent, um, and it should be able to keep in the the most wiliest of critters that you have if you've got it running cattle sheep and goats it's got to keep goats in right perhaps you already have a high tensile fence or something in place and so as long as it is high enough um with electric strand strands on top and the bottom it'll serve multiple species well for a perimeter fence be sure to pay attention though to gates and to areas where your terrain changes or where trees are fallen or may fall or where there's stumps in the fence line animals like goats have this really uncanny ability to squeeze just but underneath those areas between gates and uh, just really render a fence that would be good for cattle, no good, no good at all. So you have to pay particular attention whenever you're uh, fencing in for goats. After the perimeter fencing, you're going to be thinking about uh, your pasture and, sub, sub, uh, and subdivisions of your paddocks. Um, there's so many options out there. And the first thing you'll want to do is, is, like anything on the farm, what do you have on hand? If you currently divide your pastures with polywire, polytape, something like this, this can work really well for cattle, sheep, or goats, especially if you have, you know, three strands or so. For fairly small paddocks, electrified netting works, and it's really easy to move um, and can, can be used to move animals around within, even within a paddock. For larger paddocks, um, woven wire is really good, especially if you have two ele electric strands offset, one at the top um, and one at the one at the bottom. This works well for sheep and goats. If you want to use polywire, I recommend that you train the animals to the wire by placing them in a pen with a hot polywire and just expose it to them for a couple of weeks. Um, they'll, they'll get used to the idea. I have uh, a friend who uses a car battery and he hooks two wires um, to it, you know, six to 12 inches off of the ground and puts it in the pen and just lets them get used to it. That's a good way to uh, to train animals to, to, to wire, to poly wire, to electric wire, um, those sorts of things. <clears throat> so fencing options for pigs um, can vary a little bit different. Uh, some producers uh, recommend woven steel wire or rolls of electric netting for great, greater visibility. Um, woven wire should have a single strand of electric wire strung along the bottom a few inches off the ground because this is going to keep them from rooting underneath the fence and, and, and digging it up. Uh, one of the most effective that I've seen um, is this one that I have on the on, on the. Uh, on the screen, this is a farm in New Hampshire that I was on last year. It's three electric wires that are spaced evenly with the top wire about a foot off of the ground. This works really well, really well for internal fencing. Um, and uh, of, of course, you would have your perimeter fencing, but you could divide paddocks with this type of thing and even make lanes and things with this type of fencing. It works really well. Okay, so now let's go on to working facilities. <clears throat> a well-designed handling system is all about animal welfare. It's about ease of movement. And most importantly, really, it's about efficient and safe um, operation by you, the handler. It's important to consider the components of, your, of a handling system if, whenever you're bringing in more than one species. A, hand, a handling facility is usually constructed to accommodate a particular class. Um, it kind of complicates it whenever you add more than one because shoots and restraining systems are different for various animals. I mean, take a look here at the at the shoot system for uh, for, for for sheep here um, on, on the screen. Very different than what you'd have for cattle. Uh, but if you've got a combined herd of, say, cattle and sheep or goats, you know, a single system could be taken um, could be used to take care of both species if you have a single trap 
or a holding pin that were, would provide access to kind of two separate shoot or restraint systems. Um, in the picture is a in black is is my colleague that's Linda Coffey. Um, she's pictured with Ann Wells, a veterinarian. They uh, she is a, se a sheep producer in Arkansas, and, and she's a colleague of mine and is really knowledgeable when it comes to sheep and goat production. She runs about fifty head um, to a hundred head of sheep and does fine with a handling system that kind of lets her sort in several directions. It holds a small number of animals in a pen and allows her to get in there with a paint stick to mark the animals. It's really cheap. She ha she had just had to be thoughtful in design in designing her pins. She will tell you that you don't have to have an elaborate facility for small animals. If you already have a cattle facility and are thinking about running a few uh, sheep or goats, you can easily designate a section to handle them. Think about the animal behavior and use their natural desire to congregate in your favor whenever you're developing your pens and your handling system. But if you're going to have a large herd or a, a large flock, you know, you should go into a little bit, you know, more and, and look at the building efficiency that is designed to handle large numbers, such as the, the sheep shoot here that I have on the screen. Okay, as it changes to the next one. Um, we're, um, livestock require several different components for routine handling. Um, thinking about a crowding pin, gathering pin, working shoots, restraints, sorting pins. The sorting pins are optional, uh, but I really recommend them because it'll help you sort out animals for treatment and breeding into separate pins to make it a lot easier for you. The primary design specifications that you'll really need to consider are fence height, shoot height, and holding pin capacity. Small facility requires imagination and creativity in, in the design, especially if you're working with more than one particular species. I can't say enough about this, though. Handling facilities really need to be constructed on level ground. Remember, it's all about safety. <clears throat> for both you and the animals. Handling can be very stressful, both for you and the animals, and accidents are more likely to happen in the pens than they are out on the pasture. If your farm's on hilly land, you'll need to take care in the placement of where you put your facility. Choose the most open area you have, grade it with a dozer if you have to, get the level working yard, because there's no alternative to constructing a really safe, workable handling facility. Okay, and with that, it's time to move into some of the um, some of the aspects of that that people were asking about on, on on some of the questions that we got. Predators was one of them. This is a topic that we see a lot in dealing with producers um, here at Atra. Due to their small size, you know, sheep and goats are targets. They're targets for coyotes, mountain lions, wolves, bears, even neighborhood dogs. The first line of defense should always be strong, adequate fencing. But depending upon your location and the predator pressure that you might be experiencing, fencing may not be enough uh, to protect your livestock. Sheep and goats can be protected by a combination of adequate fencing and bonding to larger livestock species, such as cattle, as we mentioned earlier, donkey, donkeys, llamas, or by using guardian dogs. The, the ability to ex exclude predators with fencing really depends upon the predator species and the pressure or the intensity of the predatory attempts on the herd. If the pressure is low, a woven wire is often just fine. The, the, the fixed knots in the wire prevent the slippage when a predator or even a sheep tries to push through. However, when more predator pressure is experienced, a fixed knotted high tensile woven wire fence with fiberglass posts should be used and should be powered with a high jewel charger. A 30 to 50 joule charger is certainly not, not unwarranted here because you'll want to instill fear in the fence, fear of the fence in any predator that encounters it. Um, Dave Scott is a atro specialist that I work with. He's a sheep rancher in Montana, and uh, he's uh, really helped me to understand um, a lot of the issues with Western grazing and such as I am over here in the Northeast. And he recommends to producers that you use the highest um, charger jewel rating that you can, that you initially think that you need. Double it if you have to, if you've got high uh, uh, predator pressure. 
So one of the advantages of grazing can, uh, cattle and, and uh, small ruminants together is that it discourages some predators from attacking the herd because you've got you've got big uh, animals with them. Um, this works well if the animals are bonded and if they stay near each other at you know pretty much at all times. It it takes some training to first get cattle bonded to sheep or goats, but it's possible. It's done all the time. One way to do this is to pen young lambs with cattle for 30 days, provide a creep feed in there, and allow the uh, the lambs a good safe place to get to if necessary. Um, I had a, a herd of cattle whenever I was uh, in college, and I was running 30 cows in central Texas and got several sheep. Uh, I wanted to train my dog how to, how to herd, and so I got a couple of sheep to do it. And within two weeks, those sheep were bonded and thought they were cattle. They were actually pushing cattle out of the way at the feed trough. It was, it was, um, it was pretty uh, humorous to watch them. Um, but, but cattle and sheep will bond, and that'll provide some pretty good um, – some pr pretty good, uh, you know, discouragement from predators. There's safety in size and numbers, and your multi-species herd will be less bothered with predation if it, whenever they're bonded. But where there's really high pressure, it may be necessary to use guard dogs, um, and these guard dogs need to be bonded with the livestock that they're guarding. If you have multiple species and you're running a very diverse operation. It's important that the dogs are bonded which, with each one of the species that you're running. And they should be calm around the cattle, and they shouldn't be a chaser. So before you acquire a livestock um, guardian dog or some dogs, do some research. Decide what breeds will work best for you. Just please don't be tempted to pick up a free dog of a mixed breed, even if some of that mix is a guardian dog breed. Um, mixing those instincts of guardian dog uh, with herding dog can usually be a problem. It, um, however, if you want to mix two breeds like an Anatolian Shepherd or a Great Pyrenees together, both of which are guardian dog breeds, that can be fine. Just try to stay with a full a full blood guardian breed um so, uh, or you you probably won't have a, a dog that will bond and have those protective instincts starting a livestock guardian dog requires um, good understanding of dog behavior so look for those qualities of trustworthiness attentiveness and protectiveness in the dog these are working dogs and the training methods that you're that you're going to use are very different than the ones that you're going to use for obedience or for hunting or herding and they're not pets um, as much as we might want, we can't go out there and love on them and pet them, and especially in their training. Um, having <clears throat> you need to, uh, they need to be raised with the livestock so that they can bond with them, and so that those natural protective instincts they have are instilled in them from puppyhood. So these dogs can add cost to the operation, but really, in some situations, uh, it would probably be impossible to raise livestock without these protectors. So that's a little bit on, um, on predators. One of the other questions that we had um, uh, on a lot of comment on was mineral supplementation. Uh, this is a big one because grazing different species together can cause logistical problems that be, go beyond fencing and working facilities. And, you know, you think about new ways of accommodating the needs of the different animals. And one of these is mineral supplementation. It's well known that cattle minerals should not be fed to sheep because, you know, sheep have a lower tolerance of copper. Um, and as cattle, cattle mineral has more copper in it than sheep need, toxicity can occur. But even though sheep require less less copper, they still need it in their diets. So don't forego mineral for the sheep just because you're worried that, about copper toxicity. Veterinarians have actually reported copper deficiencies in sheep because producers have been too careful and they have withdrawn copper. There's a few tricks that you can use to help ensure that your animals get the minerals that they need, though, without overdosing. One way is to is to feed sheep mineral to all your species. Uh, you can do this. Um, this this can work pretty well uh, during much of the year without a problem. Though it might be necessary to provide more copper to cattle during the last trimester of gest gestation to meet all their needs. And when the cattle are in their last trimester, uh, you can feed cattle mineral in a feeder that is you know at least thirty inches high to keep it out of the reach of the sheep. And a creep feeder can be set up for sheep to access the mineral that is more appropriate for them. 
I like to mention my colleagues uh, whenever I talk. And another um, uh, good friend of mine and Atra specialist is Margot Hale. She's a sheep producer in Arkansas as well. And she's found that when pastures have a high degree of nutrient cycling, they require very little fertil fertilization. And so there's very little need for sheep mineral other than, say, 30 to 40 days pre-breeding pre and maybe 45 days before lambing, as well as during lactation at least early lactation. In healthy pastures, soil microorganisms do all the work to provide a nutrient-dense forage, and it feeds you know, the animals and meets all their needs. There's a lot of holistic grazers out there, and many of you might know Gabe Brown, who grazes livestock on cover crops as part of his rotation, and he no longer feeds cattle mineral when he's grazing his pastures. Instead, he's relying on diversity and nutrient cycling and soil health to provide for all of his animals' needs. If you use a leader follower method where cattle and sheep are on different pastures and you're grazing successfully, this can be one of the easiest ways to do it because you can just use portable feeders and provide each species their customized minerals. If your operation includes cattle and goats but not sheep, not sheep you can just simply offer a good cattle mineral to both. Another method is to provide copper oxide boluses for sheep and goats. And we'll talk a little bit about this later, but this provides mineral, but it also helps with parasite control. So um, there's one thing though about, about um, using manures. Um, this can have an effect on your pasture for fertility and your, your, your uh, mineral supplementation. Some people f fertilize with, with poultry litter and with swine manure on their livestock farms. If you have sheep, you've got to be careful with this practice because poultry litter and swine manure tend to um, have higher concentrations of copper than do cattle manure. So test your soils, test the forages, and learn about the nutrient uh, and mineral status of your pastures. Um, in some regions of the country, forages are actually copper deficient, even with poultry litter being used. So it's, you know, just because poultry litter is used doesn't really mean anything. It's a great idea to work with a nutritionist and to get, um, and to get uh, soil tests and forage tests on, 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 uh, on, your, on your pastures. So with that, let's talk a little bit about parasites. Another uh, um, issue that, you know, people look at whenever they really want to uh, think about moving to a multi-species situation. One of the most notable benefits of multi-species grazing is its effect on parasite management. But one of the cool things about grazing species together is that cattle will consume larvae such as uh, barber pole worm. Um, and this worm only affects sheep and goats. And because the worm is incompatible with the cattle, the worms will die whenever the cattle ingest them. The same thing happens whenever small ruminants consume parasites that are indigenous to cattle. Because of this um, parasite larval incompatibility between the species, cattle can, can be grazed after or with small ruminants to reduce the incidence of larval infection. And managing the sward height as well, in other words, the height of your pastures, the height of the grass and the forbs in the pastures, is a key element in controlling internal parasites. As the worm larvae uh, uh, emerge from the eggs in the ground, they travel up the leaves of the blades of the grasses and they position themselves right in the way of the grazing animal as it eats. Really convenient. But they usually don't climb higher than about four inches. So as long as you keep grazing to the top leaves of the pasture sward, the height of the pasture, and move the animals before they graze too low, you can significantly reduce the infection and the instance of infection. Try to maintain a residual of at least six inches after grazing. Also, give the paddocks a nice long recovery period. This is not only good for pasture health and resiliency, but it also allows the parasites to die off in the pasture before they can be consumed by a grazing animal. Use about a 40-day recovery period in, at the very least in those pastures that you know to be infected with parasite larvae. In addition, you can use a shorter grazing period. This benefits the pasture health because plants begin to regrow at around three or four days after they've been grazed. Um, but it also works to break the parasite's life cycle. By moving the animals off a of pasture uh, before day four, you've effectively moved them before the larv larvae are able to move up into the grass and to be consumed by the animals. 
You know, if you have a pastor that's infected with larva and you're having a hard time ridding um, the herd or the flock of parasitism, you can take that pasture right out of the grazing cycle for a few rotations. Um, you can rest that infected pasture for six weeks in a hot summer, take the forage off at hay, um, you know, at about four weeks and rest it for another two weeks. After this, the parasite's life cycle should be broken and you should be able to continue grazing as usual. As usual. Um, there's so much we could talk about whenever it comes to, um, uh, when it comes to parasite management. I think um, I'm going to refer to the multi-species grazing publication that has goes into a lot more detail and has got some good resources and references that you can follow up on. So um, before I go um, and totally leave internal parasites, I want to talk about um, kind of managing a certain amount of parasitism that we have. Animals can deal with a certain amount, right? The key here is maintaining the healthy herd of the flock and fostering natural immunity. And good nutrition, clean, fresh water, and pasture access goes a long way in doing this. One of the best, me best methods we have, though, for controlling parasitism is to actually uh, cull repeat offenders and select for resistance whenever you're breeding and acquiring new animals. Um, cattle usually handle parasites better than small ruminants do, but the goal is to manage the parasites that remain in the herd such that the, the treatments can be effective against them. This protected population of parasites in the herd or in the flock is called refugia. This is the population of parasites that remains um, relatively unexposed to dewormers through strategic dewormer treatment of only sick animals, which reduces the incidence of dewormer resistance. It makes your dewormers a little bit more useful in the future. You should develop a monitor monitoring system. This is going to be very important. A monitoring system um, should incorporate the syst systematic methods of evaluating parasitism. One of the most notable that we have is the Fumacha. Um, this is a diagnostic tool, and it looks at eyelid color in small ruminants to, ev to evaluate anemia. And this anemia is a symptom of parasitism in livestock, combined with other things such as fecal egg counts, uh, the five-point check. You can determine which animals should be treated with a dewormer, and you can prevent the whole population of worms from, be from being subjected to the treatment, again, making your dewormer treatments much more effective. Remember, you'll never be able to completely eradicate internal parasites. However, if you use this integrated system of combining livestock species together, grazing them together and sequentially, graze, maintaining a proper grazing height, and uh, using this monitoring method, um, you know you can you can really reduce the parasite load and keep your animals pretty healthy. So we're going to talk a little bit about stocking rate decisions now. We've been talking about biological efficiency and grazing dynamics and some of these practical aspects of fencing and facilities and predators and minerals and parasite management. Now we're going to look at the concerns we need to, we need to consider when adding new animals to the herd. How does that impact the grazing resource and how do you do it without overgrazing that resource, which is really important. So before you add new animals to, the, to your herd, it's good to evaluate your initial stocking rate. How many animals do you currently have and how are they using the pastures? Are you managing grazing such that the, gra the grazing animals are taking half and leaving half? Leaving half of the forage volume in the pasture after grazing is crucial. It's critical for maintaining soil cover and for allowing plat adequate plant regrowth and for adding carbon back into the soil. When you add animals, you don't want to add more than the pasture can sustain. So the goal in determining a stocking rate is you want to find that combination of two or more livestock species that are going to produce more total gain within a multi-species grazing system than within a single species grazing system. And you want to do this while maintaining the integrity of the pasture. So there's no hard and fast rule for determining the stocking rate, but it should be based pretty much on observation and, uh, and adaptation. There's a lot in the in, in the grazing world right now on adaptive grazing and, um, you know, not having a set stocking, but and not having specific movement times and things like this can be very, very uh, beneficial as you just observe what's going on in the landscape and you adapt uh, from uh, from from season to season and year to year.
So on your farm, your stocking rate will likely vary from year to year, and it, even from se season to season. It's going to change depending on temperature, rainfall, and pasture composition, animal growth rates, and a lot of other factors. Um, sheep and goat herds grow more quickly than cattle herds. Remember that. Um, it's easily to, easy to go from 50 to 100 sheep, and this can easily place a lot more pressure on your pastures. Take this into account whenever you're planning your system. Generally, you'll want to stock about one ewe to one cow is what is what you're going to want to do. Um, you can do that without adjusting your stocking rate at all, right? This is because cattle and small ruminants don't always go after the same forages. It brings up the concept of dietary overlap. Um, you can you can easily add one to one, but if you decide to move up and you're going to get you're going to add more animals there's ways that you can calculate your stocking rate and the the multi-species grazing publication goes in depth in how to um uh, factor in dietary overlap and competition and the different forages that you have and figure out how many sheep or goats you could add to a herd of cattle or how many goats or sheep, uh, how many uh, cattle you could add to a flock of sheep or goats. So we, it is 320 and we are rocketing along. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to cover um, a little bit about pigs and poultry. Um, some of the people were really interested in that um, and then kind of do a wrap up. And if we have time for questions, we'll do that. I haven't covered pigs and poultry much yet in this webinar due mainly to time constraints, um, but they both have an awesome place in multi-grazing, uh, multi-species grazing scenario and each contribute greatly to the pasture regeneration and also the benefits of income. Pigs on pasture are going to be seeking high quality vegetation, um, but they, they're going to get most of their nutrition from grains due to their high energy and protein needs. The biggest impact they can have on pasture is from their manure and from their rooting activity. They work really well following sheep and cattle. They can help renovate old, worn-out pastures, but maintaining gra adequate ground cover is a challenge and, uh, for pastured swine producers. And if not managed well, they can strip it bare and turn it into a moonscape. So the best way to do this is to provide a, a varied pasture mix of diverse forages, legumes, grasses, and stock the, the pigs appropriately with about 15 to 20 pigs or four to seven sows per acre. Um, I wish I could go into depth on the types of pasture mixes. Email me, call me. We can have a lengthy discussion on that because that's there's um, we've got a lot to say about that with with limited time. Rotate rotate these pastures. Make sure you have adequate time for regrowth. Give them space to wallow, and make sure you provide enough energy energy supplementation. And when it comes to poultry, they're seed eaters. Remember, these guys are seed eaters, but they'll pick green stuff, they'll pick the insects, and they're particularly good at decimating fly larvae and manure patties. Consider these species in rotation with lar large livestock. Um, you, can, you can run them following cattle and sheep probably about two days to five days after large livestock have led, left the pasture is whenever the parasite population of larvae start to er emerge from, their, uh, from the eggs. That is the time to send those guys in there and to let them do their job. Um, one one uh, person asked, you know, is it, you know, how many chickens is beneficial? Well, you know, there's been no really, there's been no studies uh, that I've seen on how many chickens you need to reduce the parasite loads in sheep and, and, and cows. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, anecdotal experience from producers. Really what I see is this is a function of density and the area that the poultry are going to cover. For instance, if you have an egg mobile and 75 to 100 chickens following three to five days after the Hey, Lee, we, I think we, we, we lost you. She's okay. Oh, you <laughs> You're back. Am I back? Yeah. <laughs> Good. I hope that I wasn't gone for very long. Um, but basically, um, basically, poultry can be integrated really well 
um, to follow large livestock on the pastures three to five days after they leave in order to decimate those, uh, those fly larvae. Um, I'd also like to, uh, t to mention um, Linda Coffey, Ag Specialist uh, with, with NCAT in Arkansas, is also writing a new publication on pasture pig production, and that should be out uh, sometime within the next few months. So pay attention, get on the email list, and whenever that publication comes out, um, uh, be, be sure to download that. So we're running up against time. So what I'm going to do is just kind of wrap it up really, really quick. Um, remember that this is all about matching animals to the appropriate landscape. It's about, it's about observation, adaptation. It's about um, uh, adjustment, uh, as any livestock, livestock enterprise is. You can certainly increase your income with this. I would be more than pleased to answer questions and, and to, uh, to have email or phone conversations with anybody who would like to go into a little bit more depth because I just don't think an hour is enough time to do this topic justice. So Larissa, there you go. Thank you, Lee. Excellent. So I'm just gonna, let's see skip ahead here. I'm going to say that um, we do have some past webinars that I'll send along um, when I send out the follow-up email. Linda, Linda Coffey, who's been mentioned, did an excellent series about mm -hmm. managing internal parasites last year yep. for us. And we also have a five-part series about livestock guardian animals and um, predator protection. So I will send along those links. Perfect. Kind of as a compliment, but there are, yeah, we do have a couple minutes for questions. Uh, there's a couple that came in that I don't think were answered um, explicitly. So I'm going to do is read some of these out loud and then um, Lee will, Lee will respond. So the question is, if you could talk a little bit about um, uh, a good mix of animals, if you include alpacas and perhaps also llamas, how would that look? Well, um, alpacas and llamas, uh, though, those are excellent um, large animals for, 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 predator, uh, protect, for predator protection, for sure, in addition to the economic benefit you get from, from, from selling uh, fiber, no doubt. Um, we do have on the Atra website uh, several calculators that were developed by Dave Scott that help producers come up with uh, uh, grazing plans for alpacas and llamas specifically. Taking into consideration their size and their intake and things like that, that can greatly help, I think, including uh, alpacas into, into the rotation. Um, other, otherwise, they are, uh, uh, they are animals that typically are nibblers, uh, uh, more of a, an intermediate grazer, and I think you would probably put them in as an intermediate grazer whenever you're thinking about what types of plants they're going to be, uh, they're going to be uh, focused on. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, so a couple questions about fencing that came in. Someone's asking what with low electric wires, how do you keep the grass off during the, gro the growing season? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, one of the ways certainly can be with actual grazing. If it's if it's a foot off the ground, they can actually graze under underneath it, and they they can learn not to touch it. I've seen that happen, but really, the the only the only way that I've seen to do this is to is periodic maintenance. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we can't get a, away from, a, a, you know, a weed whacker or something like this to come in periodically and just take it down to the level and give yourself a couple of weeks of undisturbed, um, uh, you know, un, undisturbed uh, fence utilization, <laughs> right? There's, there's no easy way for that. Um, a lot of people have been asking me about that and I've thought and thought and thought, uh, you know, um, is there, a, is, is there a silver bullet for that? And there's really not, uh, that, that, that I, that I have heard of. If there is anybody, anybody knows of one, type it into the chat bar. <laughs> exactly. Always learning. Mm -hmm. Um, well, so, uh, kind of, the next one about fencing is about goats, those wily creatures. And mm -hmm. if you're constructing a poly wire only fence for goats, what would be the best number of wires to use and what heights should they be spaced? Yep, I would do three wires at the very least. And I, and, and, I, and this would not be the perimeter fence, right? This would right. be paddock right. separations. Mm -hmm. And I would probably make the, 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 the top one about 36 to 40 inches. And I would make the bottom one at about eight to 12. And then I would equally space the middle one between them. Um, 
And that's where I would start. See what happens. Remember what we said, uh, uh, observe and adapt. Whenever you start doing this, put you know, put it in an area where you can observe and it's in a safe area so that if they escape, you've got perimeter fencing that's going to keep them off the highway, right? Watch how they're doing. Is it high enough? It's not high enough. They're jumping, right? Mm -hmm. Make it a little bit higher. But that's where I would start. And I would definitely have no less than three, uh, three, three um, poly, poly wires. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Um, someone's asking, do you have any recommendations how to get FEMACHA training? Um, I don't because I'm not a sheep specialist, but Linda yeah. Coffee is. And I will say that you can contact her from our website. You can also go to wormx.info. That's W O R M X. Dot info. That is the um, website for the American Consortium on Small Ruminant Parasite Control. Excellent resources on parasite control. They'll talk about, they've got, they've got uh, publications and guidance and things on FAMACHA and things on the five point check. That's, that's, that's probably the best place to go to get information on developing a monitoring plan. Okay, excellent. Um, someone wrote in that there is an under the fence line mower for weed ma maintenance. I guess there you go. So you're trading. So you're trading your work for your money. So which, whichever <laughs> one is more important to you. Absolutely. Sometimes it's like, nope. I'm sorry. I've got two miles, three miles, ten miles of fence. Yeah. Get the under. Get get the mower. Thank you for writing that in. So I'm I'm gonna take one more question and then we'll um. We'll wrap it up, and, I, and Lee did say that he is available um, for follow-up questions. I'll be including him in our on our email, and um, he is very accessible and it's just a, a really wonderful resource. So, um, so the last question we have is: Do you have any comments about the potential for goose plus cattle and sheep, or what issues might it cause? Geese and cattle and sheep. Wow. I, I tell you what, the only thing that I know about geese is I had an experience one time when I was a kid walking into a barnyard. And from then on, I have been on a bad relationship with geese. Um, honestly, I'm going to have to look that one up. And I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk to my colleagues and do some research. I'm going to see if I can see if there's any particular considerations with, with geese, specifically over other over other. Uh, other poultry species. And um, so I've written that one down. And someone wrote in specifically that they, they do have geese, cattle, and sheep, and be careful, the geese eat a lot. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and uh, eat a lot, are you, do you mean they get into like the, 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 the cattle, the sheep's uh, grain? Is that what you're talking about? I'm not sure, but maybe, maybe um, our viewer- Eat, eat a, a lot, lot of the pasture, okay. Very good. Into it. Well, excellent. Okay. Well, um, yeah. So wonderful. I do just want to do a, have a, a few housekeeping items before we sign off officially today. Uh, for those of you that are still with us, um, reminder that immediately following the webinar, there is a very, very brief survey, and we would really appreciate it if you take a minute to tell us about your experience. You can also add um, any ideas. Actually, a couple really great ideas have come in about. Uh, topics for future webinars that kind of were inspired by Lee's presentation today. So if, if you know, I'll, I'll take notes on that as well. Um, so we, a recording of the webinar and the slides will be available soon. And I'm going to email them all to you in the morning, next tomorrow morning, and then uh, they will be archived on our website. Uh, so we do have some other services I just want to flag for you all. There are more webinars coming up. Um, you can join us for one or, or more than one. Uh, we are currently accepting applications for our Fund a Farmer grants and our Humane Farming Mentorship Program. So I will include links to the webinars, the grants, and uh, information about the, the mentorship program in my follow-up email. Um, Lee, do you have any parting thoughts before... I close no, I just I just want to thank everybody for attending, and I I'm glad that it kind of turned out to be a bit of a conversation. I'm glad that some people had some answers. That's awesome because conversations <laughs> really work best. Um, my email is there on the screen. Um, feel free to, to to zip me a line. I would be happy to get on the phone. We can discuss things back and forth and just go into a little bit more depth than what we could with an hour on this topic. That there's just so much. There's so much that we just couldn't get to. So I would be happy to, to continue with this conversation. 
Excellent. Well, it's certainly been a pleasure to have you with us today, Lee. And, you know, we, we all really appreciate you sharing your insight and your experience and taking the time to answer our questions now and later. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone out there in the audience for sticking around um, and for your, you know, taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us, um, for your interest and your attention and, you know, trying, trying to... Um, produce in this way and raise your animals this way. Um, I hope that you will see you on another webinar again soon. So I hope everyone has a, a really great afternoon and um, we'll, we'll keep in touch. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.